these are a lot cheerier. Than the other Why are they ringing the doorbell? It says open. It's a Is store. that a doorbell? I thought, I thought it was just the, the, it's the, oh, it's the shop. Oh, it's just the shop. We have to turn it off. I was like, I totally thought I turned it off. I was like, do you think Brad lives here? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just so if like we're in the back, we know somebody walked in. That makes sense. Time, that makes more sense. None. There we go. I think you should play John Cena's entry music. Okay, we're good to go live, guys. Is this uh, like wait right just in the one way? second? Kind of, but it's okay. We weren't necessarily watching, you know, stare at your. Please. No, oh, I hope not. <laughs> You're gonna be disappointed. <laughs> what if I? My eyes are up here, ladies. <laughs> uh, so what I'm thinking is, um, we'll bring up two main points on the episode itself. Uh, one about the the sort of what kind of story is this, and whose story is it, and then the other we can just talk about a couple of like school of the prophets. Brigham Young conspiracy, right? That we can give a little context for those things, and then when we pivot to more abstract, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce your kind of like historical analysis mm -hmm. by um, talking a little bit more abstractly about how religion's categorical term, and therefore it's a it's a term in which we think of it in, in terms of like things belonging and not belonging to it, kind of frame it that way, and then you okay. can kind of excavate some of the history of how we've come to to view it the way we do. Okay. It's also just like um, a continuation of the conversation about the problem of definition. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, yeah, if you fill in a lot of the actual historical stuff about the development of as a mo as sort of like a modern concept, it's really important. It's important to be able to, um, like the Old Testament, you can say religion. Right. No, yeah, the, the word doesn't exist until... No. I think the medieval Islam is the first to create some kind of an umbrella term that yeah, resembles it and that it gets the developed. The Dean word that, that mm -hmm. gets further developed in Renaissance. And I want to point out how it's in the conflict of different social groups, different cultures, that it is created to kind of, as a, a rhetorical tool, as a, yeah. as a way to structure power and values and stuff. It's a, it's a word that's similar to words like, hey, I'm another former student. Long time. How have you been? Good, how are you? Oh, not bad, not bad. It's been a while. Um, that, it's, that it's a word that's, you know, again, it's ostensibly neutral and descriptive, but right. it's actually a word like... Um, oh, heavens, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Do you need help? Tracy's up there to help too. What was it? It was my old light bulb that fell. Oh, geez. That's scary. That was a perfect sound effect, though. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody record that? I, I thought little pieces of glass were going to start raining down. Them. <laughs> Maybe they still will eventually. <laughs> they sweep that. That it's that it's a little bit like um, that, you know that that um, totally neutrally descriptive taxonomy that yeah. like uh, well that. That like Morgan and, and Wesley Powell came up with of like uh, uh, primitive primitives barbarism civilization right yeah we're just describing there's no this isn't a judgment you yeah know. and it's it's really about making sure all the people are kept down in the in the lower register the lower class where our their subordination to us, our subjugation of them, is is valid, mm -hmm. is um, justified, and so religion gets contrasted, is 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 built out of the contrast between good religion and bad religion. Right. So the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, first of all, Judaism and Islam, second of all, non monotheistic religions, third of all, but then sort of on the opposite end, like shamanism or various yeah. kinds of indigenous animism. Yeah. yeah. But it creates it creates this like hierarchy yeah. that centers yeah. Protestantism. <clears throat> There's a very cool book. Um, one of the books I was looking at here reminded me of it: the invention of world God in indigenous societies by Cox. And it's a few case studies about how we went into indigenous societies and told them, "Well, this is your religion." But then, explained to them, yeah. But we. The framework we imposed and 
It should be back there. It's um, not? No, sorry, right? It should be in here. Are we yeah. are we rolling on both? I don't remember that. Are we rolling down here, Esther? Yes. yes okay. Yes. So we can just start. Yeah, you can go for it. I was gonna say the the first oh, chapter is about uh, the New Zealand, the Maori, uh -huh. Aotearoa, and uh, they talk a lot about Latter Day Saints. And oh, interesting. And yeah, and how. Um, because because that's what that's one case where we actually have some decent historical scholarship on on the history of Mormonism yeah. in Maori yeah. context. Oh, I think we have to. No, we got to turn it on. And then, can you reach the? There we go. And then, testing. Here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, thank you everybody for being here for our, uh, this is our, I guess this is our fourth discussion. We're Penultimate. discussing episode five um, of Under the Banner of Heaven, the FX series based on John Krakauer's book. I should have brought a copy of the book up too, but um, we are not doing a discussion next week. We'll be, we won't meet here on Labor Day, but the week after that we'll do our sort of wrap up discussion uh, in, in which we talk about episode six and seven. And like, uh, unlike some of the uh, privileged scholars of Mormonism out there, I have not seen all the episodes, <laughs> and neither has Dan. So we're, we're watching in real time with you guys. Um, today, we like, like most, most of these discussions, we have some uh, concrete things to say about the episode itself. And then we'll probably uh, transition a little bit into a slightly more abstract discussion uh, about religion. Uh, something that Dan and I both in our respective fields study a lot and, and uh, theorize a lot about. So um, pre-apologies for uh, getting too much in the theoretical weeds on that stuff, but we'll try to keep it, we'll try to keep it light. Um, so to start, um, again, there's always this interesting balance here because we've, we've tried to give a pretty wide berth to, to the uh, sort of the creative license that goes into making a production like this. Um, uh, there's a quote that uh, when you're doing a biographical pick or a histor like actual historical based on true events kind of, kind of uh, film work that it's not about telling the truth, it's about bending the truth as far as you can without breaking it. Okay. Um, that, by the way, that, that quote is from Dustin Lance Black. So, so um, but I understand it, you know, like, so we've, we've tried to be very, like, uh, to recognize that a lot of the creative choices, like, there's a lot of situations where a, a, a conscious filmmaker is, is going to have to be trying to balance um, either historical or kind of ethnographic accuracy is this how Mormons talk? Is this how Mormons dress? Is this how Mormons play in the yard? Whatever. And also, is this what Mormons did in the 19th century? Having to balance those things against telling an interesting story and telling a coherent story. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think came especially clear in this episode is that there is a certain um, dramatic agenda behind... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, taking creative license with historical events, right? Like you, we see that in this episode, the, the sort of trying to draw the parallel between Brigham Young and Roy Lafferty is, is enhanced significantly by making Brigham Young complicit in the death of the prophet that he's going to replace. So this, this parallel between, interestingly, not between Dan and Joseph and, and Roy and Brigham, which is kind of what I expected, but between uh, between um, Ammon and and Joseph and then and then Ron and Brigham, 
So uh, again, we always ha we, we always have to be mindful. Like I find myself cringing sometimes and saying like, oh, this is frustrating. This is so wrong. This is so off. But then I try to somehow like put myself in the position of an ignorant outsider and say like, does this work dramatically? And it can be a little hard to see that sometimes just because like I'm so outside of the narrative. I'm so sort of inside my own head about like these these superficial problems or these these uh, you know ethnographic problems or whatever. But most of the time I can step outside of that enough to say, yeah, this makes dramatic sense. Yeah, that probably doesn't sound cringy to an outsider. That probably makes it sound more interesting, more scary, whatever. Um, I still thought that there were, um, uh, uh, there were a couple of things that we should at least clarify from a historical perspective. Um, and then, um, and then maybe address some larger thematic or even dramatic issues that we might still have with it. I can think of it just in our in our discussion, we've been talking about um, one, I think, still kind of persistent problem with uh, with the way the story is being told, even from a dramatic perspective that um, that I think at least is, you know, deserves consideration, especially considering the polemics of the show. But but before we get there, I'll, I'll kind of like sh uh, shift over to Dan to talk about that. Um, but I, I thought it might be useful to address just two quick things. One is the, the Brigham Young, John Taylor conspiracy to murder Joseph Smith and uh, use Emma's fake letter to trick him into coming back and that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and then the other is uh, School of the Prophets. Okay. So, um, Prophet singular. Did you say plural prophets? <laughs> um, there can only be one. <laughs> there can only be one. Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know. I don't know which of those you want to address first. Um, get the school of the prophets one out of the way. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting verbiage, which means that they can use real Mormon verbiage, and it still sounds sort of weird to outsiders. Um, but it's like it's it's an actual thing in Mormonism that gets used in the in the, the story here, not at all in the way that the Mormons use it. Sort of on two levels. One is this idea that like nobody's ever heard of it, right? That like a guy who can be like, no, that John Taylor sermon was 1879, sir. <laughs> but like, wait, say that again. School of prophets, <laughs> you know. Um, like, we, le we learned about the School of the Prophets in Sunday school and stuff and in seminary, and it was just like, it was this thing in Kirtland, it was this like study group thing in Kirtland, and it's where, it's where the lectures on faith happened, you know? I was, I was wondering when he corrected him on that, I, I wonder if this was a, to suggest that he had gone back and studied up, um, that the, all the questioning and Alan had kind of... Um, and it compelled him to go uh, research all these things he didn't know, if, if, if that was kind of pointing in that direction. Yeah, I didn't really understand that line at all when he's like, is that an LDS thing? He's like, no, this is very specific. And it's like, no, that's an LDS thing. And I'm, what is it it's specific? What are we supposed to infer that you know about it that other people don't know or something? Yeah. But it is a very LDS thing, and it's a very benign LDS thing. It's not about conspiring for, for access to leadership. If anything, it's about kind of like universalizing the priesthood and universalizing of uh, gifts of the Spirit, in, which at, at the time definitely included prophecy. Um, but it was just like a, it was just like a, a, a sort of a, it feels like a combination between like an Elks Lodge and a, and a, and a book group for dudes, you know? It's the, it's the place that where like Emma got really sick of cleaning up spittoons and was like, we need a revelation on tobacco, please. What was the uh, what was the greeting? Are you a brother or brethren? Um, oh, it was like a lengthy. Uh, yeah, they, had they had a salutation yeah. at, at the school. Art thou a brother or brethren? I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in token or remembrance of the everlasting covenant. Yeah, there's a, a lengthy thing about part, that. Part of what's interesting about that is that, and, and, and I think we're going to find out a little more about this in an upcoming um, volume that, that some Mormon studies nerds have been waiting for for a long time. Um, uh, Joe Swick and Nick Letursi and, and Cheryl Bruno have been working on the, um, a, a, a volume on Mormonism and Mason, Masonry. 
called Method Infinite for a really, really, really long time. Um, and I think Covert is publishing it in the next two months or something like that. There's a there's another uh, interesting book. I haven't read through it all yet. Uh, Joseph. Stiles. Yeah, Michael Michael Homer's. Yeah. Okay. So what, I guess what I'm saying is we may we may end up finding out that even though obviously Freemasonry is going to become much more pro, play a much more prominent role in Nauvoo Mormonism. That the, that the Smith family's relationship to Masonry is much older than that. Joseph Sr. and Hiram have both been Masons for a long time. There's also a fair amount of anti-Freemasonry sort of discourse in the Kirtland period. So Freemasonry is kind of everywhere. And, and it's entirely possible that there are either uh, Masonic or anti-Masonic overtones to the School of the Prophets, like an alternative to Freemasonry. Um, there's And there's all kinds of just wild, wild coincidences there. Um, like uh, the one the one person, so a guy named uh, uh, Morgan, William Morgan, uh, wrote an expose on Freemasonry in the in the 1820s, revealed all the all the secrets that they're not supposed to reveal and stuff, published it. And then he disappeared. He just and it was never found. And it's the only case in in all of like, modern history that we have of even like a even like a possible situation where masons actually again we don't we never we never found him like he was never found his body was never found um after seven years his wife lucinda remarried um and moved with her husband to a little town in ohio called kirtland and became one of joseph smith's first plural wives eventually Joseph Smith would potentially be the only other candidate in, in recorded history of somebody who might have been killed because of something involving masonry. And she was married to both of these guys. Um, so we need a show about her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we do. Uh, it's, uh, so, so, you know, the, the, the School of the Prophets was not, um, it's not a, a sort of like uh, anti-prophet conspiracy or uh, we're going to take over, we're going to get rid of the prophet. Like the idea of, of killing, getting getting rid of a rival prophet so that you can assume power, is, I I think honestly, like, <laughs> like not Mormon, very foreign to Mormonism. Um, there's no evidence for it anywhere in our history, and the School of the Prophets doesn't carry any of those kind of undertones. If anything, it's 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 about um, ecclesiastical leaders and. Prophetic leaders like Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon uh, treating other men, at least, uh, on some level as equals. Um, and 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 so you know that's I mean I don't, what, what 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 would you like to say about the School of Prophets besides? Um, yeah, we have it uh, that art thou a brother or brethren is from D N C eighty eight. Right. So it's in the, the School of Prophets is mentioned in the, in the Doctrine and Covenants. So it's mentioned a few it. times in the Doctrine yeah. and Covenants, I think, yeah. Um, and it sounds like uh, Dan and Ron and these others were just creating a, a, you know, a scripture study group and thought it would be cool to call it School of the Prophets. Uh, and there's a, lot more, there's a lot of, and the problem with uh, appropriating a title like that is it gives people an opportunity to import a whole lot of assumptions about what's going on. And this is one of the issues I'm going to get to later with the concept of religion, how labeling something a religion is not descriptive. It is very much prescriptive. It's and normative, it, yeah. And is intentionally importing a lot of assumptions. So we're filling in a ton of gaps in ways that serve our rhetorical goals. And I, and I wonder, I'm not sure, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Dan called the, the study group a school of prophets. One thing that I think is we, we can say that in a certain sense that the show is still getting right here is not only the degree to which these kind of study groups in the 80s and 90s especially were very common um, uh, in, in the church, but the, the degree to which uh, they often end up being seedbeds for talking about radical ideas and for talking about polygamy. They really did. Like people would get together, dudes like, who were just like businessmen or whatever, who led normal lives, like that guy. What, what was the character's name? Uh, the Trinia. guy with the, the, yeah, with the beard. The, the trimmed beard, right? Brady, something Brady. Brady. Yeah, yeah, brother Brady. Like that that that's a pretty I think actually like clo close to accurate character and that just guys like that were getting together reading esoteric Mormon stuff um, 
stuff that tended to have either to do with polygamy or with having your calling and election made sure and seeing like having a personal visitation by Jesus and stuff. A lot of self-published books grew out of these these sort of book group movements and stuff like that. Um, and it was it was definitely like a part of the culture in 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 the 1980s. So it does that that doesn't strike me as surprising at all that they were meeting together that it involved some kind of like more r radical thinkers or people that were sort of outside of the social mainstream talking with people that were inside of the social mainstream safely talking about dangerous subjects or whatever and then in this case you know it it it, it i guess maybe further dan's radicalization i don't know and i i was a an adult convert to the church i didn't know any of, of this history but i do recall wanting to like start up study groups when I uh, got back from my mission and uh, being told that was a big time no-no. Not a good and idea. I was, Those and things I was like, get out of hand. Why yeah. is everybody so sensitive about this? Yeah. Um, I, I had no idea about this. Denver Snuffer group. started as a study group. I'm not, not joking. I don't know if any of you know who Denver Snuffer is, but that's, that's probably a subject for a different discussion. You should look <laughs> him up. Den Denver Snuffer, his, his name, that's his real name, Denver yeah. Snuffer, and he's now a leader of a, of, a, of a sort of schismatic movement. And he's published his own scripture as well. He's published his own scripture, but lo long before that he was publishing books, including books that were being stocked at Deseret Book for a while. Like, <laughs> like he's, a, he's, a, he's, be, he's been building a movement for a long time, and it started out as a book group, and then morphed into a blog, and is now uh, something very special. Um, so that I, I, I don't know if we want to kind of leave the the school of prophets thing. Yeah, I don't yeah, think I don't that's think like a. I don't think that does violence to Mormons to sort of misportray it that way. It's an interesting shorthand, and I'm sure it, I'm sure it was like really cool for outsiders to like. Ooh, that sounds creepy. Ooh, that sounds weird. You know, whatever. And, that yeah, works. And and the there can be only one kind of uh, Highlander aspect of it. I thought was an odd way to try to to try to instill it with some sinister character and um, yeah nature. But that, again, that's trying to sort of shoehorn the parallel with the fake thing that Brigham Young did, yeah. right? Like, the, the whole thing is about, like, ooh, like we're going to displace a prophet so that somebody new can ascend in his, in his stead or whatever. Um, and, the, and it'll probably be the, the same guy that killed him that takes his place. And that's where we have Alan explaining this in parallel to Ron confronting, uh, or at least engaging with Ammon, right? Is that... Do yeah. I remember correctly? That's where. That's. I mean, yeah. Is it? Do those things happen in parallel? I think. Because I know somebody's explaining something while Ron is is you know withholding the water from from yeah. his father in the bed. And, and is that when Alan's started. explaining? Is that when he's doing the whole like? Did you say prophets plural? Uh, is that the same scene? Plural was slightly before. Yeah. Just before. Okay. Yeah. But at least set, it's setting the stage for. I for thought it, I thought it was comparing it with something in Nauvoo. With, like the, the the back and forth at that point was the, the, back, and, the back and forth was with um, with Ron killing the father and uh, then the which is shooting, a thing that did not happen shooting, by the way. <laughs> and then it was a shooting at Carthage right. followed by Brigham right. Young yeah. assuming power yeah. with a speech. Gotcha. gotcha. That, that's what it was. Going that's through. what it was. Yeah, it was that. It was the actual Carthage thing, which yeah. I thought they did really well. I, did, I, I the thing that shocked surprised me about it was they had it out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 were, we were watching... I had always understood it as kind of uh, at least next to uh, a town. I think it is actually. I, 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 it, I don't is think, the, it is in the town. It, now it it's in the town. town. I'm not sure how far... Like, like a, I'm not sure how... historical buildings all around it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's just in a... There, there would have been streets at least. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you have another a comment? Yeah. Uh, I found it interesting that they chose to frame School of the Prophets as this like really weird concept. Because I feel like they could, like, I have no idea what the historical context around the actual original School of the Prophets was. But, like, I would imagine that if anybody heard about this thing that Mormons were doing in Kirtland, they would think it was a weird, mystical thing that Joseph was doing. Like, oh, they're training more of them, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I just find it really interesting that they, like... Like, like a wizarding like, school. Yeah, like, they, <laughs> they, they place it as a, as, a, as a weird thing in the 1980s. But it probably was a weird thing when it was happening. Right, and they could, if they wanted to do that switch, they could have, they could have done it. They could have done a parallel between just the Bible study class they're doing that's called the School of the Prophets and the original School of the Prophets, which they had been doing the entire time, going back and forth, doing parallels. I think it's really weird that they didn't do that. Yeah, 
Well, it would have it would have taken them out of chronology in in the flashbacks because oh, they've done the flashbacks fairly chronologically. That's but also, true. but also, Bible study was a big part of the Second Great Awakening. Yeah, I mean that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, developed from, and so that it would not have been entirely uncommon. I mean, calling it School of the Prophets maybe was a little peculiar. But even then, like you could yeah. argue then that if the Bible study was a big part of Second Great Awakening, that then it would be even stronger parallel between them making us. Trying to do a fundamentalist schism in the eighties around something historical like yeah. that, yeah. But, yeah. but but instead of drawing the parallel, they pretend like it rose out of nowhere, and it's this thing that, that carries these sinister overtones that maybe yeah. Ron wants to kill his dad and or the the one true prophet it, Spencer W. Kimball. I mean, the whole thing is pointing towards like a historical like fascism, like going back to the good days. Yeah, like and I, I think it would be more legible to do it as they're not doing like a weird new thing. They're like bastardizing the old thing exactly they're trying to they, they they're, they're grasping a hold of this thing from the past just like they're doing with all this other stuff yeah um but you're trying but but instead what they're trying to do is is draw a parallel to a thing that did not happen in the past mm -hmm. so a, th a parallel between a thing that did not happen in the present which is ron killing his dad did not happen and then a thing that did not happen in the past which is brigham young killing Joseph Smith. So we, we definitely have to talk about the context of that letter or that or that message from from Emma. Yeah, and that's I'm Mormon history is not my uh, forte, as I've made abundantly clear, um, <laughs> mostly unintentionally here. But um, now, what do you know more about the background of this? Was there a letter that was intercepted? So, so there was no one, letter. Okay, there was no letter, but there was a message that was delivered. Because I, I know that this and is it, where he talks about his life not being of any value to his friends, and so it's of no value to me, and turns around and goes back. Correct. Turns around right. and goes back, but but he also goes back because like like Emma, the the message which is just a an oral message. It's right. not a letter. There's no intercepted letter. And Brigham Young, like, they also frame it as like, oh, Joseph was gone and he was in hiding and Brigham Young took over. Joseph was gone for like a day and a half and Brigham Young was in, I think, Boston on a mission campaigning for Joseph for president. Mm -hmm. um, Br Brigham Young obsequiously worshipped Joseph Smith. I mean, he was, he was completely devoted to it. So was John Taylor, you know. Um, but... Uh, it, and so, so there are a number of ways in which this is like like the the show sort of gets this wrong, but but part of it, what something that it gestures toward, and then and then sort of like um, Alan suggests, oh, this is the way, this is what we normally think, but this is the reality. The thing that we normally think is actually correct that like it was. You have to remember they've been talking this whole time about uh, Joseph amassing we weapons and uh, and an army, and he's strutting around in his Military lieutenant weapon. general uniform and stuff like that. And it doesn't even get commented on that, like, he doesn't mobilize the Legion. He just tries to leave. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he thinks that if he leaves, it will calm things down if they know that he's not there. Right? But instead, it, like, puts the actual people in the crosshairs. Like, there's violence that's about to break out, and Emma convinces him that he can stop the violence if he comes back and surrenders. That they're not there to lynch him, that the governor has promised he'll get a fair trial, um, and that they'll they'll take him into proper custody and they'll guard him and they'll protect him. Um, and and so he agrees to do that, and he and he says and it's also when he says like I'm I feel like I'm I'm going like a lamb, lamb to the slaughter. slaughter, but I'm as calm as a whatever spring lamb or something or calm as I don't I don't I don't remember exactly what he says, but. That's where that sort of famous line comes from. Um, it's just like standard frontier mob violence. Like there's just a there's just a guy that really really pisses people off, and they think that he's not going to get he's not going to face justice if he gets to go to the big city for a trial, and so they kill him. And and anybody who's with him, there's there's you know there's going to be a, a a problem there yeah. that like they might get caught in the crossfire, including Hiram. But also, there's absolutely no, um, there's no reason in Nauvoo whatsoever for there to be a succession crisis when Joseph dies, because every single person in Nauvoo, hundred percent, knows who replaces Joseph Smith if he dies, and it's Hiram, who was literally the co the co president of the church right. at the time. Um, the succession crisis happens because they kill Joseph and his successor at the same time. And the idea that Brigham Young organized that even is, is even more absurd, right? 
Um, Brigham Young, like most of the 12, they were traveling, they were outside of, of Nauvoo. Like part, what, what, the, the function that the 12 had during Joseph's lifetime was uh, what was different than it is today. They were, among other things, they were called, they were more likely to be called the traveling high council than the quorum of the 12. There's a high council in Nauvoo. There's a stake in Nauvoo. There's a first presidency in Nauvoo. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and then there's a traveling high council. And the traveling high council's job is essentially to administer the church outside of that central stake. So the traveling high council runs the church outside of Nauvoo. They run missionary work, but they also just like run the branches that are all over the place, little branches everywhere, including in Western Europe. Um, and, uh, and, and then they also play a critical role in, in trying to campaign in Joseph's kind of protest candidate for, candidacy for president. He doesn't think he's gonna become president. He's, he's, it's a protest candidacy, but he does want his message to kind of get out there. And these guys are off campaigning for him when sort of everything goes down in Nauvoo. It goes down in Nauvoo because, like, Joseph makes a huge, huge, huge mistake, which is that instead of, instead of just, even just, like, censoring a press that was, like, William Law was printing accurate things about plural marriage, there were plenty of rumors about plural marriage because John C. Bennett had been writing them for a long time, but John C. Bennett was seen as a disaffected outsider. William Law was still very respected inside the community. He had been in the first presidency, and the falling out that, that Law and his wife had had with Joseph and Emma was privately known, but not generally publicly known. He was still well respected. So if William Law comes out and says this is happening, um, Mormons in Nauvoo are going to take it much more seriously than if that scoundrel John C. Bennett is printing that stuff. So Joseph wants to suppress that, that press, that, that newspaper, but he also destroys it. He, he, I mean, he doesn't go and destroy it himself. He authorizes, like, the, like the, uh, as, as mayor, he and the city council authorize its destruction, and then it's destroyed. And that's just like, he's, I mean, he's already seen as like, a, as like a, a, having committed treason against the state of Missouri, having uh, possibly being complicit in an assassination tent, attempt against a sitting governor. Um, and as somebody who is subverting democracy there in the state, because the Mormon population in Nauvoo is big enough that it can swing statewide election, elections if they vote in block, right? Um, w which means it could even like change the outcome of the, you know, the composition of the Senate or something like that. So people are very, very leery already about the block voting thing. And then there's all these rumors that there's also plural marriage happening. And, and people are increasingly uncomfortable with the size of the Nauvoo Legion. And there are, there are marshals trying to arrest and extradite Joseph. And he's, he's evading arrest all the time and stuff like that because they want to take him back to Missouri and try him again there for treason and, treason and execute him. Um, and... And then, like the the like he he sparks the powder keg with the with the uh, destroying the press, and then suddenly it, suddenly it's just like everything is caving in, and so he tries to leave, and he goes and he does he camps on the other side of the river, and then a message gets sent um, through Reynolds Cahoon from Emma, convincing him like like prevailing upon him to come back to trust. Governor Ford, that he'll be taken care of, and then and then he's he's killed by a mob. When so at the time, Sidney Rigdon, who's the other member of the first presidency, is gone. He's living in Pennsylvania because there's a there's a rule that he's he's Joseph's vice, vice presidential candidate, even though he's been a little bit unstable ever since he injured his head, getting dragged across the field in in Kirtland. Um, Joseph still has a very soft spot in his heart for him. Uh, he's in the first presidency, and he's and he's his VP candidate. And so he's just getting residency, basically, in Pennsylvania. Brigham is gone. Um, and uh, But there are other potential sort of claimants. Again, with Hiram gone, it's not clear that Sidney has a claim because the first presidency has essentially been dissolved. Legally, legally, the, the property is controlled by the president of the church revert to the first presidency in the case of his death, but the first presidency only had three members, and two of them are now gone. So 
the, the, the claim against Sidney Rigdon controlling the church is that the First Presidency was dissolved by the assassination. It's no longer a, a, a legal entity that still exists. Um, William Marks is the stake president in Nauvoo, extremely well respected, um, could have probably made a successful claim to uh, run the church if he had tried to. He would later back Joseph Jr.'s, um, or Joseph III's, um, when he sort of came of age and wanted to create a reorganized church, like to reorganize First Presidency, um, Marx backed him. But it, you know that's more more than a decade later. Um, but Brigham and, and Brigham Young, Sidney Reagan, and then and then this guy shows up uh, named James Strang, and so they all sort of have these different sources of claim for taking Joseph's place. Um, uh, Sidney's claim is by virtue of being in the first presidency, by virtue of being sort of like a right-hand man, and, and by having the longest standing relationship with Joseph as a church leader. James Strang starts reproducing Joseph's gifts. He starts, he finds plates in the ground, he translates them. Um, uh, what, uh, what's his name? Martin Harris is one of his witnesses <laughs> for like, for like the miraculous translation of these plates. Um, the plates are really weird too. It's a really, it's a really fascinating story because they're clearly fabrications. But like, the 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 language that he sort of invents on the plates, that he then translates, is really wild. It's really, really, really weird. Um, anyway, he ends up he ends up like uh, like I think ten or fifteen percent of the saints in Nauvoo end up following him, and he eventually goes and and starts practicing polygamy. And declares himself the king of Beaver Island in Lake Michigan, um, and and there's a, there's a, there's still there's still Strangites around today. They're head, they're headquartered in Wisconsin now, but so that's James Strang. But there's this there's this sort of standoff thing between Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon, and the thing is that like part of the way that Brigham Young so Sidney comes in and he basically makes a straightforward claim that I am the person who should replace Joseph for x y and z reasons and Brigham really doesn't make a counterclaim to that instead he stands up and he says um, nobody needs to replace Joseph Smith we don't need a new first presidency we don't need a new prophet Joseph is still the prophet but he delegated all the keys which were consolidated in him all those keys are still distributed in the quorum of the twelve Quorum has the keys, the work will go on. I happen to be president of the quorum, but I don't have all the keys. They weren't all given to me. They're distributed in the quorum. We don't need a new first presidency. We don't need a new prophet. We just need, I, I'm just uh, like a, a, a steward watching the flock, but Joseph is still the prophet. And that's the case that he makes publicly to the saints, and they, that really resonates with him. And eventually, years later, when people are, are writing reminiscences about it, that's the situation where they see, they see like the transfiguration of, of Brigham Young. But it's not till they're crossing the plains later that Brigham actually, uh, in part because of Wilford Woodruff and um, Heber J. Grant, not Heber J. Grant, um, uh, just uh, Heber C. Kimball, kind of convince Brigham that he needs to reorganize the first presidency because saints traveling need a very, very strong central leadership. Now, I'm not trying to say that Brigham was like a really nice, forward-thinking, gentle, progressive guy or anything like that. I'm just saying this is the way that the history actually played out. He did consolidate power and reorganize the first presidency as he was crossing the plains, and he did rule with highly consolidated power in Utah. But, um, but, th but that's sort of the way that actually... Like the the, the 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 sort of succession stuff played out, not Brigham Young pulling strings behind with John Taylor, especially um, of all people. Like like if John Taylor was the type of guy that if he thought Brigham Young was plotting against Joseph Smith, he would have killed him. Show, and probably vice versa, actually. The show's showing more of a conflict between um, Brigham and Emma. Morris, but right? but the implication is that they took the letter. And that and the Brigham or, or John uh, 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 inserted language into the letter that would guilt Joseph into coming back, essentially to trap him so that he would be, he would be killed and they could take over. Right? And, and, it, and it's definitely, like, that, that's a historically accurate thing. Like, the bad blood between Emma and Brigham is absolutely correct. I, I mean, 
if you're going to completely villainize Brigham Young, it, it makes sense because of the feuds they have, he's afterwards with Emma, mm -hmm. that if you're going to purely demonize Brigham Young uh, over something that he didn't even do, but, uh, like, it kind of makes sense to, to have him intercept the letter from Emma that makes Joseph go, and that that's him. Like, narratively. Yeah. Like, like... Because it, it, it makes it too complicated otherwise. Right. It's, uh, it, it's, it's simplifying a, a story that they are partially fabricating in order to create this parallel with Ron. Yes. Which as as, as the lion of the Lord, which itself is fabricated. But, but, <laughs> but again, like, it's, the, it's the story that they're telling. It's not like, like you know. I, I, I'm trying to think, because Brigham later blames Emma. Oh, or Joseph's they dead. absolutely blame Emma. Like, he, like, like her, that her convincing him to come back across, which, which almost certainly did actually save the Saints from like serious bloodshed. They, they absolutely blame her for it. Yeah. After the fact, there's yeah. a hand behind you too. I do wonder because a lot of the historical flashbacks come to the, in my interpretation, the storytelling of the Lafferty. Right. I do wonder how much of that is like mm -hmm. untru untrustworthy narrators yeah. telling the history of the church. And there is actually, so there's kind of a basis for that because there is actually a, like a conspiracy theory out there that blames Brigham Young for and John Taylor uh, for, for the for the death, for the assassination. But it's from people that are trying to make the claim that Joseph didn't have anything to do with polygamy and that and that Brigham sort of like like a uh, retcon polygamy onto onto Nauvoo. Uh, but and it had to get Joseph out of the way in order to do it. I think I think that would be a pretty. Uh, there would have to be kind of a twist at the end. I think for us to be strung along through this, placing these things parallel, the contemporary events with the early church events, uh, seen through the eyes of Alan, uh, at the end to then be like, oh, but Alan's reconstructing this inaccurately, or something. Especially like because because there are now there are now scenes where it's clear that like what like like to the extent that what we're seeing historically is in the is in the mind of one of the characters, it's often in the mind of Pyrie. Yeah, and not Alan, and I and or I not one of the Lafferty's. At at least in this episode, I felt like Pyrie's faith crisis was kind of centered. At least toward the uh, toward the end of the episode, it's very clear that Brenda is not the focus the of the the thesis statement of this series. It is very clearly Pyrie's faith is being corroded through learning about church history and then experiencing these parallel uh, events, which which I find problematic. However, I have read where uh, Black has said, "Don't give up on Alan yet." Something. I don't know. Evidently, something is coming with uh, with Alan's uh, falling away, or or what? I don't know what to expect. But... In, in any case, it feels a little bit like like a slow motion fridging of Brenda in order yeah. to facilitate a character arc for Pyrie. And, is... and 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 I do not like that about it. Yeah. Like like this is a story that that you could have told that centers her experience, that centers her. Her victimhood, but also her, you know, her struggles and 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 just like honors her, but instead it's like what happens to her and her baby feels like a pretext for a charismatic male character to uh, progress. Yeah, throw to, off to, the to shackles see, of this, to see of truth this, yeah. and move forward. Which is an odd, which is an odd way of um, a lot of what Black has said is that this is about. Uh, misogyny in a sexist church, and he's and that seems to be the center of what he's aiming at. But why not use a more effective uh, narrative device? For it's that? kind of a misogynistic storytelling trope, if we're being honest. Yeah, like yeah. it's it's a little it's a little frustrating. Like I know he's I know he's not intending that or whatever, and I you know it's just it's it frustrates me, and 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 especially the degree to then which they're also making her into some kind of like like. Um, uh, like esoteric sacrifice in the vision of some kind of weird culty. Like Ron killed her because he was pissed that she got, she convinced his wife to leave him, and yeah. he was just it was just like good old fashioned male rage and male jealousy. Yeah. And he was just scapegoating her, and he didn't he didn't need any of Dan's bullshit in order to want to kill her. And particularly, um, and they even kind of lean into that a little bit by saying Ron left the note for them to find. 
Yeah. Like the the prosecution, I think that was the argument that was made. This revelation was a pretense for yeah. basically what was just revenge. But I didn't think I didn't think that that Pyre was saying he left that note for us as a pretense. I think he was saying he was trying to turn him into like a super villain. Like he's he he oh, been he's out he's them. been out thinking us from the start. He left that yeah. for us yeah. so that we would be in this situation where you know. Go ahead. I think. Uh, it, Talking about how it's how Pyre is is like a misogynistic character that he's like taking the focus from Brenda. I think the if I were to give like a fully charitable reading to this, mm-hmm. I would say that the the narrative thing that they're doing is um, it is obvious to his partner that the church is misogynistic and that the church is problematic from the beginning. Um, like when the guy calls him the Lamanite and he's like, actually, my daddy's a Paiute, um, and then. And it's, it becomes obvious to all of the women in the in the Laffrey family, well, I forget how to say the name, uh, yeah. in the Laffrey family that like this is that like there is misogyny going on here, like that there is a problem in the church with men having all the power and having a lot of control over their wives, and and it causing us harm, and it causing them harm, and yeah. then Brenda's character arc then ends with her doing something that pushes that to the limit and then gets killed for it, mm-hmm. and and then her death and her bringing all of this up all at once is enough for uh, uh, Andrew Garfield's character to finally see the misogyny that's always been present. Yeah, yeah. Like, and that, I, I think that is a, that's a charitable but fair reading of the story, I it's, think. It's not that he's, like, carrying telling. the torch or anything. That no. he's, like, finishing her thing. It's that, like, it's, it's that like he's getting hit by it all at once because right. he's never had to look at it before. There's even that moment where he says to his wife, like, we need to delay the baptism. And then he, like squeezes out the words like as the priesthood holder <laughs> and he has to think about that for a second um and so i, I think i i'd hope that's that's what they're trying to do th- th- that it's like this has become legible to him yeah this this by the way this also reminds me of one one quick thing that i want to bring up about the episode that really bothered me a lot actually and that was the implication that the, that the bishop and the state leadership were holding his family hostage by having them over for family night. Oh, yeah. Like, that, to me, that's almost as a, maybe even more absurd than the, like, I'm the state president and I'm here to pick, take these boys home. Well, you, I have authority here. Every opportunity the show has had to have Pyrie engage with members of the church hierarchy or structure, they are kind of stock villains. Mm-hmm. They are doing everything wrong. They're trying he, to threaten him with at least subtextually, if not yeah, overtly. Yeah, even, even the, the older lady who confronts him out, uh, out front of the, uh-huh. whether that was the state president's wife or somebody else uh, threatening him about, about baptizing the, the children, every other member of the church is a villain and uh it's it's feels very heavy-handed uh in that regard and that he's the it's all about him and his relationship to to the church yeah and um so i i think that you know it's once again it's it's pretty clear that whatever whatever larger polemic is going on here uh with the storytelling whatever larger message or themes that, that uh, Black wants us to tease out or wants us to explore or whatever. And again, I, I, I want to just go on the record saying that no, like, even, even, if he's, even if he's taking creative license, even if he's doing ham-fisted things, it's, that's not a valid excuse to refuse to actually engage questions that the show is bringing up. And I think, there, I think the show, even in its own way, is bringing up really, really important questions for Mormons. Um, but but there's there's probably there's a larger even larger than just questions Mormons have to face up to or whatever. There's a even a larger kind of polemical context here um, that has to do with religion itself. Again, so we, we we've addressed this to some degree in previous weeks, and I want to kind of continue this. So um, we want to talk a little bit abstractly about religion just as a word and a category. Uh, and and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit sort of conceptually about it, and then we're going to switch, and, and Dan's going to uh, fill in some of the, the history. So um, there are a few things that we can say. Like, I mean, I, mean, I when I teach classes in anthropology, even if it's just like introductory classes where I do a unit on this, or if it's classes where you know the whole thing is about religion, um, it's, it's sort of hard to say what religion is, except there's one thing we can say for sure about it, and that's that it's a word. 
And that's not really a cop out. Like that's where that's a starting point. Religion is a word, and like all words, it has usage patterns, and those patterns have usage histories. And we can talk a little bit about what we might mean with the word religion just by looking at how it gets used. Um, uh, so we can think of it. So in the first place, one thing we have to note right up front is that it's a word that, in, in some ways, is parallel to the word language which is to say that it's a category term uh, that, uh, that where, where it grammatically functions like a mass noun, like, like water or, or evil or something like that. Um, but then it can also, and, and therefore it's not pluralizable, right? But as it, as, as it applies to specific instances or specific instantiations of the type, it's pluralizable. So there is religion, and then there are religions that are sort of fit in the category. Right. This is a religion. This is a religion. These are all examples of religion. Same thing with language. There's human language as a kind of total phenomenon, and then there are languages. So religion is a category term first and foremost that works again grammatically, kind of like the word language works. It's a category term, and if it's a category term, I mean it's a taxon it's a taxonomic term, right? It's a term that we say, okay, this this is a type of thing that exists in the world. And then there are things out there that are either that or not that. And we have, to, we have to come up with some criteria, some kind of definitional criteria for deciding whether something is religion or is not religion. So that's just, that's just the starting point is to say, look, this is a category term. And therefore, um, any definitional work that we do or even just any attempt at using the word accurately uh, in, involves making value judgments about what is and is not religion, and as we're gonna and, and as we're gonna demonstrate, uh, especially when Dan starts talking again, um, the, the the term religion itself is heavily invested not just in the distinction between religion and non-religion, like what is religion and what is not religion, what what things are almost religion, what things are barely religion, right? Where's that boundary, that definitional border? But also internal to that border, right? Or internal, like 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 the the, the term itself, what, what's encompassed by the term, right? Um, there's a there's a kind of uh, uh, center periphery logic to it as well. Like, like we said, some things are mm, that's religion, but probably only just bare. Like is Scientology religion is. Is Hinduism or not? It, 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 you know, Hinduism is clearly religion. Is is Buddhism religion? Right? It's college sports religion. No. Um, is nationalism religion? Maybe sometimes. Um, but the point is, we're we're sort of like going off of instinct here, just what we think does or doesn't belong in the circle, right? And then and then theorists social scientists and, and scholars who study religion try to come up with a definition. And so they say, okay, well, what, it, what is a, I don't know, a, a list, a set of bullet points, a paragraph that I can write that accurately and comprehensively describes everything in the circle and nothing outside of it. It's not, you, you, you make it broad enough that it covers everything you don't, you don't come up with a definition that accidentally excludes things that it shouldn't exclude, right? But you also don't make it so overbroad that it includes things like college sports, right? You gotta get that perfect paragraph, writing that perfect paragraph. And lots of scholars think that writing that perfect paragraph is where you do the work of defining religion, okay? But that is absolutely a secondary and subsidiary defining process. You defined religion when you drew the circle. You defined religion when you instinctively decided what belongs inside and outside of the circle before you tried to do any work actually writing that paragraph. It's all, all the 90% of the definitional work is done by what you include and exclude. And so there are value judgments that pertain again to the border, what is and isn't religion, but also to the relationship between the periphery and the center. In other words, what is prototype what is prototypical religion? What epitomizes religion versus what is kind of not, doesn't quite, like, you get further away from that epitomizing instance and it's, it gets less and less. So it's the difference between religion and non-religion out on the border 
But internal, it's the different definition between real religion and less real, or good religion and bad religion. So it's not a judgment-free term, and it never has been. It's a modern term that serves modern purposes, and it has a history as a category. You don't find the word religion in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. I mean, we look at the Old Testament and we say, oh, look at these things the Israelites are doing. That's religion, that's religion, that's religion. But that's us imposing a categorical analysis. That's us taxonomizing Israelite life and saying certain things that they do are count as religion, certain things don't. But that's a modern imposition of a categorical value onto, on, on, like onto a system that did not invoke that term. Nobody in ancient Israel is saying this thing that we're doing is religion. It's our version of the thing that the Canaanites are doing, that they have their religion and they have their religion. This is ours. That's not, that's not the way the pre-modern world operates. Okay? They, might, they might have other things, that, you know, things in common. They might say this is how we worship. Right? They might say this is how we retain our purity. They might say this is how we expiate our sins or something like that. Things that we associate. They might say these, this is what we think we know about the nature of God. This is how we pray. I mean, these are, these are things that, again, we all associate these things with religion. But that category term did not exist. It has a modern history. It went from not existing to existing. And the other quick thing I'll say about it linguistically is that it, it, it doesn't really have like a, a, a language of origin in the sense that it's not a term that is native to one language and then a cognate in all other languages. Okay? It's, it, it's, it's borrowed from Latin, but the Latin word, the Latin roots of it do not refer to what we call religion. So in a certain sense, one of the striking things about religion is the word, as a word, is that it's a cognate in every language. But it's got a history of us, and, and, and Dan's going to pick this up now, because it's a very interesting history where we go from not using religion as a way of making sense out of the world and saying this and this and this and this and this belong in the category, this and this and this and this don't, this and this belong in the middle of the category, these and these belong on the outside. It's a, it's a very modern concept. And I think the we're... What, do you have your hand up or are you just playing with your hair? I'm just playing. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, there are a couple of assumptions that we make, not just uh, kind of colloquially, but even within scholarship with words like this that have been around for generations and generations. One is that this it labels something that exists in the world, that it is descriptive, that there's something out there that this mm -hmm. labels that as a result. And that it's neutrally descriptive. Right. We're and, just, like, it's, it's just like saying this is a stem. Or something. And as a result, we can use it predictively. We can use it as a heuristic to, when you find something new, we can say, is this this thing, yes or no? It is, that means it belongs okay, over here. What, is it, what does it have on it? Does this, does this new plant we found count as a flower? What does it have to have to count as a flower? Does this new thing that these natives are doing in this, in this space that we're trying to colonize, does what they're doing count as religion? And what we find is throughout history, as this develops as, as a, a religion, as a genus, is that it develops precisely to structure values and power for groups that are trying to understand their relationship to other groups. If you go back to the Greco-Roman period, the Latin term religio, which uh, we're not exactly sure what the etymology has to do with. Some people think it has to do with tying. Tying and binding. And binding. Um, but it seems to have referred primarily to a kind of internal um, <clears throat> uh, scrupulousness where people had kind of anxiety. Something, something a little like conscience. Something like that. It was like there were um, you had expectations with uh, regarding your relationships with other people, and so you had to perform you had certain behaviors uh, in light of that. There is a uh, there's a comedy from I think the second century BCE where somebody says, "Oh, he invited me to dinner, and I had religio, so I could not say no." So yeah. I went to the dinner. It's, so, it's something like reciprocity and moral obligation mixed with what yeah. we would call conscience today. And, and it's something, it's generally described as something that in some people is more salient and acute 
than others. So some people have this high degree of, of scrupulosity, and so they're worried about, and this bleeds into baseball players wearing the same socks until they lose or something like that. Uh, people uh, with uh, obsessive compulsive habits where, you know, they have to knock so many times or they have to uh, step over a line so many times, all these kinds of things are what they would have called religio back then. They would not have called, they would not have used it to refer to a system of beliefs and practices related to deity yeah. because they did not organize it that way. Um, just like anciently, they had balls, they had people who kicked them, but they did not have soccer. Soccer, <laughs> anciently. You have the constituent elements. That does not mean it was organized the way we organize it today. I time traveled and I saw a guy kicking a ball. They had <laughs> yeah, soccer. Yeah, duh. We gotta, we've got we to gotta announce that. It was soccer. And so when you get to um, Augustine, he actually says Christianity is not a religion, uh, a religio, because this does not only have to do with... It was used frequently to refer to these, this uh, scrupulosity in relation to our relationship to deity. And he says... It does not only refer to that, to piety with the gods. It can also refer to just any human relationship. And as a result, it's not a handy word to refer to what Christianity is. Right. He's saying, yeah, yes, Christians have this kind of uh, uh, submissive sensibility toward God uh, and scrupulosity in their behavior with respect to God. But they also have it with respect to everything, the institutions, people, people right. in power, friends, family. It doesn't cover, like calling it a religion doesn't work because everything's religion. And in medieval Christianity is taken up, you, you have this dichotomy of secular and religious in medieval Christianity. However, doesn't secular... Mean, doesn't mean what it means today. <laughs> right. Secular and religious refers to what kind of monastic order you belong to. You are either a secular priest or a religious priest. And if you are a religious priest, that means you belong to a specific monastic order. You are a Benedictine. You are whatever. Whereas a secular priest meant... You didn't have any specific, you know, you, there was no frat that you were a part of. You yeah. were just on your own. You were kind of an unaffiliated priest. Right. And that also often, tra oftentimes translates into secular priests having more um, service-based rather than overtly ecclesiastical responsibilities. Yeah. Like they tend to be doing more things like feeding, feeding the poor or, or managing land or something like, like things that you would sort of consider to just be like every day rather than explicitly religious. So it's more like kinship networks. It would, I, I would say that's a conceptual parallel to what's yeah. going on. There are definitely institutions that are developing um, that function the way that kinship networks function, but we're not quite, they were not thought of as kinship networks. But you, you still have this, this idea of scrupulousness that was also used sometimes to refer to, to uh, in reference to this word uh, religio. And so it came to refer to worship uh, because worship is now a, a pretty significant thing. It's become organized within Christianity. And then you have it an becomes important because because part of what happens with Christianity is that ever like it, increasingly people are expected to worship the same way. So there's a kind of standardization, and then and then a uh, a, a, a spread, you know, a growth, uh, a social growth of of uh, of a standardized form of worship or a standardized form of religio, right? Where it's not just your own sort of disposition toward God, your own uh, sensibility of, of submission and awe or something like that. But like there are things that you do and you do them and they do them because this is the way that you do them. And everybody does it the same way. So they had a correlation department. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had different, uh, different tools that they used. In that. Um, and in the, uh, as Islam and Christianity begin to conflict you start to see them trying to organize their knowledge about the world in relation to the other. We're now coming in, in more direct and constant contact with these folks. Uh, how are we to understand what they're doing in relation to their gods uh, related to what we're doing? And you have a lot of people who are demonizing and marginalizing Islam. And you had some interesting folks. The Renaissance is a result of classical and other texts that had been preserved in Arabic translation being translated back into Latin and Greek and so that they could... Including probably that play. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> like, like, like a lot of Greco-Roman stuff yeah. is, 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 re, is revived, is, is sort of re, 
refound, rediscovered yeah. uh, from from Islamic civilization, which had, because really like Greco-Roman civilization was not the, the the sort of like the southern outpost of European civilization. It was a, it was a northern outpost of Mediterranean, a late northern outpost of Mediterranean civilization. They saw themselves as Mediterraneans. They admired the uh, the Egyptians the way that. Um, uh, like you know, like like modern Western Europeans admired Greece and Rome. Like they had a, a, a sort of a similar relationship there. So they were like the, the commerce of not just not just you know things and, and money and stuff. The commerce of ideas for for the Greco Romans meant that the idea that, that the writings of Aristotle or or you know uh, were circulating in the Islamic world yeah. and being preserved there, even even once. Even once you know, Greco-Roman civilization fails, it's preserved in Islamic civilization, so the Europeans can later rediscover it. And the uh, particularly the Italians with their banking system and and they're facilitating a lot of internationalism that's going on. And you have in 1453 the fall of Constantinople to Islam, basically. Mm -hmm. And this is this is horrific for most of Christendom. But you have uh, an interesting response from Nicholas of Cusa who is uh, a humanist and is looking not for a way to say they're uh, you know, barbaric and we're civilized, but to try to unite the groups. And he comes up with this idea that in some ways kind of goes back to an earlier concept of what religio is and in some ways advances it by saying, look, we don't have different patterns of worship uh, using the word religio. He says there is one religio and we just, it's just being shined through, resulting in these different rites and rituals. And he defines religio as this internal impulse to worship God. So it's, a, it's an incremental elaboration on going all the way back to this scrupulosity idea. And religio is now this internal impulse common to all humanity. And that there is a more pure manifestation in Christianity, according to uh, Nicholas, but Islam is just a culturally uh, distinct manifestation of that same impulse. And you get a, a somewhat different idea from Marsilio Ficino, who is also trying to come up with a way to find the common humanity in all of this. So in a way, they're taking the, the warring that is going on between Christendom and, and Islam and trying to unite these groups by saying we are the same. In the name of commerce and getting on, because, yeah. if, because if, if European Christians and, uh, and, 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 and Muslims in, in the Islamic world do not get along, um, that's gonna, like, it, that, that creates supply chain problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Serious, like, Silk yeah. Road supply chain. This is, like, the, the date he mentioned is the, is, you know, the mid-1400s, right? Within a couple of decades, you, you see major innovations in Western Europe in navigational technology, um, sailing technology, in part because, like, it's just becoming cost prohibitive to continue to get uh, Eastern goods and Eastern, like, luxury goods to sell to, to rich Europeans through overland uh, commerce networks. And so they're trying to find a way to sail directly uh, to, to India and to China. And, and they figure that out. When's, when's da Gama, do you remember? I, remember? I think it's like 1480s. And then Columbus is like, we can do it going west because the world is much smaller than you all think it is. And they're like, no, it's not. It's just as big as everybody says it is. And he's like, no, it's much smaller. And he thinks India is right, <laughs> where, right where the... Caribbean is. He, he got when he gets snack. to the Caribbean, he's like, yeah, we were in India. Yay. We, I won. I was right. We're in India. You're Indians, right? <laughs> and so an interesting thing happens within a century. Uh, this idea, oh, all these rites are just ornaments to this internal impulse to worship gets picked up by folks like Luther and others who say, the rights are not important. Maybe, maybe the rights don't matter that much. Right. Maybe that inner thing is what it's really matters. It's all inside of us. It's all about what is internal to us. And this is the rise of the Reformation, which takes uh, Catholicism and tries to interiorize religion even further. But now it's not solely about trying to overcome these conflicts. It's also about structuring power. Uh, Luther and the other... In, in particular, power in relationship to Rome. Yeah, to the to the church because you had the church was controlled everything. It was the most powerful institution in Europe. Right, at and the time. there was no distinction between church and state at the yeah. time. They were the same thing. However, you did have a lot of 
princes and rulers in different countries throughout Europe who were like, the church shouldn't have all power. I like this guy. I, I should have a little more yeah, power yeah. now that I think about it. I like yeah. it. He's we should support is, this yeah. guy. And so they take um, Catholicism and uh, try to interiorize it and get rid of all the ornamentation that we now know is external to uh, this internal impulse. And so I've, I've said before, the main question of Christianity changes from, is your love of God sincere, to are your beliefs true? And this is what Reformation develop, the Reformation develops, this idea that religion is really just about what you believe. And, is the, and are the things that you're doing really changing you in a way that brings you closer to God? Versus are they just outward manifestations of cor believing correct things about God? Go ahead. So on this concept of belief, um, and I've, I've like researched this and, and written about it as well, and I want to know how wrong I am. Um, like, so, so as I understand it, like, this is a, like the idea of religion centering on belief or like any thing that we would modernly call a religion centering on uh, someone's belief and affirmation of that belief. That is like a purely Protestant concept. Like no other, even like... Even if you're talking about like Confucian filial piety or like you know uh, uh, you know Shintoism isn't even really a religion or like uh, uh, but like you know uh, animistic beliefs in spirits um, specifically specifically in China because that's what I know the best um, like none of that is belief oriented at no. all like like this, the centering of belief is deeply Protestant and which like it's because it's anti-Catholic <laughs> is this so so. Follow-up question then. Uh, uh, in these places where, like, you you like, where the, the predominant perspective is is a uh, uh, one of supernatural presence, mm -hmm. um, is it is this because it is assumed that you do believe, or it is assumed that it is true in some way? Therefore, belief is not like a conflict that you have, or is it that you perform the rites no matter what, and so it doesn't really matter. I would say more of the about. latter. It's the the idea is. We have a lot of conventions that we do. When I was in England, I started lifting up my pinky when I would drink tea because it made me feel like I was a part of that community. And so in a thousand years, are they going to say that was a religion? Um, because everybody did it. Religion, the, what we label religion was a way for communities to forge a shared identity and to say, this person belongs, they're one of us, they're doing the rites, we participate in these, in these conventions and things. And whether people believed it or not, they would, they would do it, they would engage in the behaviors. This was costly signaling, uh, credibility enhancing displays, ways to increase social cohesion so that social groups could grow in size and complexity without mitigating uh, cooperation and um, getting along and things like that. So there are a lot of ways we do that today. Uh, belief in a secular state in a lot of ways Has a similar fulfills function, yeah. the same things that what we label religion has fulfilled throughout the So the beliefs in conspiracies, so then, beliefs in different kinds of powerful people or powerful entities. Clothing can do this to, in a lot of ways. Jewelry. Houses. Trying to keep us down. So that isn't entirely possible that Protestantism is like, like the centering of belief in modern Christianity is like an absolute failure of doing the job that religion has historically done to establish a legible in-group, out-group that you can participate in that allows for group unity. Because I don't know there's, always this, there's always this like not a real Christian, like this imposter thing. Yes and no. It creates a more flexible, I would say, system because beliefs are cannot be tested. Which yeah. is in part which is in part why Protestantism, once it's sort of like once that break comes away from Catholicism, it doesn't take very long for huge varieties of Protestantism to to develop all, you know, just like everywhere it goes, it grows a new variety of itself. Yeah. And they can be as different from each other as Anglicanism is from Mormonism, from Seventh day Adventism, from from Southern Baptism. I mean, you know, Calvinism. There's just there's all kinds of there's this just huge fluorescence of different types because because of what Dan's saying. But in some ways, it makes it more flexible and more adaptable. Yeah, and, and I, I would suggest that it becomes more fit from an evolutionary point of view within this environment because you can make it whatever you want to make it. It, it makes it a little easier for it to take hold in a yeah. wide variety of, of contexts, which is, which is why I think Protestantism generally... Um, like it, like in the modern world has had uh, an enormous amount of missionizing success in, in 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 hugely varied 
parts of the world. Now it hasn't been tried in other parts. Yeah. So who, so who knows? But there's still plenty of parts in the world where it hasn't been made, made any inroads at all. But where you didn't have to practice circumcision, or you didn't have to practice specific kinds of baptism, or you didn't have to wear specific kinds of clothes, or go to specific buildings, or give money to specific people, when it was just, how do you feel about this list of propositions? It becomes a lot more flexible and um, a lot more utilitarian. Uh, now, uh, this gives way to the debate between revealed religion and natural religion, because you, in the Enlightenment, you have uh, the deists are coming in and kind of adopting this notion of a rational religion, and, and it's just about these beliefs in, in a, you know, some kind of power, providence, whatever. And then it's sort of just distantly governing order by governing right. just by like up, upholding natural right. order and the Reformation, minimally intervening. And the Reformation has facilitated this, has made it possible for this to now become, um, you know, well, we have our own list of propositions, but we arrived at them through reason and nature and not because it was revealed through scripture. Uh, and this is happening as we are now becoming aware of new societies all around the world. Uh, Which is why I brought up Columbus in the first place, because, no. because like the colonialism is a huge historical factor here as well. And one of the things that this newfound religion, now, now we have dichotomized the secular from the religious. We have created this dichotomy in order to allow us to say, um, you know, all, violence is only authorized on the secular side of things. The religious side of things, that's your own private internal beliefs and that's where it stays religion so one of the things that religion can't do almost definitionally by, by the time by, by the time we sort of standardize religion as a as a cross-cultural cross-linguistic categorical term is religion can no longer authorize legitimate violence yeah so it gets put in a corner but in it, a certain sense it's the opposite of the state yes yeah it's uh i think that's a, a great way to put it but as we're finding all these people, we, we've got to figure out, okay, well, what is your religion? And they didn't really have anything that fit into this box. And so some, one of the things that the Enlightenment era does is it finds a way to recalibrate its concept of religion so that it can subsume. It can incorporate more all variety. These things, yes, everything that they're finding out in the world. But also what's important is that it needs to do it in a way that makes us the pinnacle the ultimate expression the highest evolutionary stage and everything else a lower evolutionary phase so religion then becomes a thing that's like a lot of other things that's like trade that's like production that's like kinship where whereas as this sort of like early anthropological taxonomy is developing in the 1900s or in the 1800s right of like okay every every human society in the world goes through the same evolutionary process to from beginning with savagery uh, moving into uh, barbarism yeah. and then and then onto civilization. They're all at different stages, but they're all on a continuum. Um, we are the most mm -hmm. civilized, so when we encounter non-civilized people, we're looking at living fossils. We're looking at ourselves in the past, but they're all on the same continuum. It, the, the the first anthropological museums didn't organize artifacts by region or people. They lumped them all together. This, the artifacts that they thought were functionally similar. As a way of kind of uh, of kind of universalizing, like oh well, this this is where all you know these kinds of brushes or these kinds of tools go or whatever. No matter where they came from, no matter how old or new they were, because what it was trying to, to sort of represent in, in in the space of the uh, uh, the exhibition was this this massive theory, this massive sort of grand unified conceptualization of humans going from primitive to modern, and so you could then also fit religion into that thing. So you could go and you could say, yes, this counts as a religion. They just have a much more primitive religion than we do. Much less developed, much less evolved. But we can still count it as religion now. Because, again, our definition of religion doesn't just concern itself with the difference between religion and non-religion. It also concerns itself with the difference between good religion and bad religion. Modern religion, primitive religion. Evolved religion, monotheistic religion. Um, more morally superior religion, et cetera, et cetera, versus these, you know, more ceremonial, more animistic, more like you, 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 you name it. it. It allows for an internal taxonomy to the category itself that once again places Protestant Christianity at the apex. Which also means that 
it produces this paternalistic notion that you need our help. We're here to lift you up and to help guide you into the our new world. Because and part that, of that taxonomy that I'm talking about of, of you know, like, a, like, like John Wesley Powell saying uh, everybody's on this trajectory from, from savage to primitive to civilized, right, is part, part of his thesis about that was that savage and, uh, uh, and, and barbaric uh, groups are having their progress accelerated by coming in contact with civilized groups. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they don't have to take as long as we took because we can now move them along. And so, and so missionizing fits perfectly yeah. into this logic. They don't have to evolve Christianity for the next 5,000 years. We can give it to them now. But missionizing and the European economic model go hand in hand. So you don't get one without the other. Yep. Because this is about exploitation, rationalizing, authorizing exploitation. And so, civilizing. Civilization right. not just as a thing, but as a process. Yeah, and so um, now you had... You had your hand up the second. Oh, ago. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking, so I'm thinking this, this idea of like how it's kind of a more modern idea and a Protestant idea of like that religion is based on truth or like what's, what's true or not true or um, like belief like that. I'm kind of thinking like it's modern here anyway, but and this is totally anecdotal. But when I was a missionary in Peru, mm -hmm. which is a not European. I mean, it's it's had European influence, but it's also had a whole other history besides mm -hmm. Europe, and also very Catholic. So outside, as of opposed to Protestant, yeah. Um, when I was a missionary down there, I remember at first I was super frustrated by the, and I noticed that like nobody seems to care about whether this is true or not. That was not really a concept, no. an important concept to the people there. That was just like it was more along the lines of like, do I like is this is this good? Is this something is this I want right to do? For me? Is this, yeah. yeah, that. And that was like, for part of what you're saying about like missionizing and like making it feel like, oh, we're, we're giving them something better. I definitely had that thought process for a while where I was like, oh, oh yeah, I did as a missionary to too. Teach them Super the colonial. Truth yeah. Is what's important, right? Like, and the thing is, I also, unfair. for me, it was also about economics. I'd be, I'd be like, I feel like I was just as much missionizing. I'd be like, listen to me, cab driver. This isn't how capitalism works, <laughs> <laughs> right? And that I was also like civilizing my subjects by, 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 you know, right. America explaining how to, have, how to have an economy. Right. A couple of really interesting books that have to do with not only uh, how, like, we talk about ritual as something native to religion. It's something all humans engage in across way the board. Way bigger than religion. And the way we kind of compartmentalize ritual is about religion is 100% uh, a function of this religion is whatever we need it to be in order to facilitate European imperialism and colonialism. Uh, an, an interesting book, and I'm trying to make this visible on camera, is called The Invention of God in Indigenous Societies by James Cox. It's a, it's a pretty short book, but it talks about how, how, we, how indigenous societies today kind of frame uh, deity, particularly to the outside world, is largely a product of Protestants going in and telling them, oh, that's your God, that's your scripture, that's this, that, and the other, and shaping how they have found, how they find social capital in representing themselves. And one of the early chapters is actually about um, Mormons Aotearoa. converting yeah, um, Maori. Maori supreme being, yeah. The debate over eel is the pre-Christian Maori supreme being, and they're going to talk about Latter-day Saints. Go ahead. Um, so how does this all fit in to, like, because cause you talk about the modern scholarship on, on uh, uh, basically all deity worship. Well, like, like the idea is that deity worship all was predated by ancestor worship. No, not always, but at least that's, I, I think, one of the main sources of okay. the national deities that we tend to think of as prototypical of deity today. So, so is this in the way of, like, because from, like, a biology perspective, in terms of how they talk about evolution, it's like, this is a strategy that works in a lot of cases, or a tendency that things have, uh, like carcinization of everything becomes a crab eventually. Um, there's six different evolutionary lineages that all became crabs. Um, and, and not necessarily that these things are more evolved, but are like better fit for right. the situation. It's, 
And, and there's like, there are steps that you have to go along to get to certain points, but that doesn't mean it's more evolved. It just means it's fitting in a new In a certain niche. sense, everything that's alive is just as evolved as everything else. Yeah. yeah. And, there's a, and there's a debate uh, about the degree to which what we label religion is uh, whether it's an adaptation or a spandrel. Uh -huh. uh, and, and the, I you guys like know what a spandrel is? A, a byproduct. Like pigeons being superstitious. Um, it's, uh, so the, the hybrid view that I, that I take is that, uh, the adaptation is our hypersensitivity to agents in the world around us, our desire to conform, our, uh, desire for social cohesion. I and I would add that a, hyper, a hypersensitivity to patterns yeah. and an inability, like, like we, like we're, 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 we're pattern recognizers and recognizing patterns, being hypersensitive to patterns is very, very, very useful for surviving. But the more sensitive you are to recognizing patterns, even very subtle patterns, the more susceptible you are to false positives. And we get false positives all the time. You look down on the carpet, and it's not going to take you very long to find a face, right? Yeah. Uh, you look at the bricks, it's not going to take you very long to find a design of some kind in the bricks, in the clouds, etc. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 uh, we, we obsessively just are we're scanning, scanning for patterns we, do, we don't even do it consciously. It's just like a default setting. Mm -hmm. But we're also very bad at, dis at, at sort of consciously distinguishing causality from intentionality. And so when we recognize patterns of cause and effect in the natural world, we recognize, um, on the one hand, we recognize that there's probably more to what's going on than we can immediately see. That if we can see patterns on the surface, they might be reflective of an underlying order. Um, an order that applies in different contexts and different circumstances, and that this is just a particular manifestation of. And then also the idea that there are agents involved when uh, uh, you know, cause and effect things occur that are um, consequential, that matter. That, that like the, the default would be to, to see this as an act of an agent like it's it's a very very I think modern thing that probably coincides a lot with the rise of religion. The idea that um, that natural cause and effect is pure happenstance. That there's that there's no causality. You can't go back and ultimately find intentionality and agency somewhere behind it. Like yes, A is causing B, but why? If you keep going back and you keep going back, eventually you're going to find a causing agent. You're going to find an intentionality there. And uh, it's just hard for us to make sense out of a lot of stuff in, in purely sort of in terms of purely mechanistic, totally non agentive causality. So, like Dan says, we're hypersensitive to reading uh, not just patterns, uh, but especially patterns of causality to over ascribing agency to causality. And these are all things that are good for our brains, but then they also make us very susceptible to. Um, Susceptible is the wrong word because it makes it sound like it's you know like susceptible to something bad or whatever. It just it just makes us yeah like we're just we're just kind of like religious creatures because of this. If yeah. we if we were bad at this stuff, we we wouldn't have religion. It doesn't mean that it doesn't. It, that's not even saying that like this is the only reason that religion exists is because we do these things. Like there's even still room for like a supernatural beings in this equation. Like you're not going to give. You're not going to give language to creatures without a prefrontal cortex, and you're not going to give, you're not going to give religion to creatures that don't <laughs> pattern recognize and and ascribe cause uh, ascribe agency to everything. And so the the next step in this hybrid evolutionary model is cultural evolution, which is not guided by uh, you know genetic um, happenstance, but by intentional the intro, intentional introduction of changes that may not actually increase fitness, but may just serve some other uh, some other entity's goals or, or make them more fit. Another the other book I wanted to talk about is called The Ritual Animal uh, by Harvey Whitehouse. It's from like within the last couple of months. White House is awesome. Uh, and this talks about the evolutionary cognitive roots of ritual and the seven different kinds of things that ritual does uh, and how humans are ritual animals. Uh, now we've, like I Religious said, or not. compartmentalized it in one way, but the clothes we wear, the, the celebrations we do, what the state does, you know, like I said, lifting a finger when you drink My, Micro tea. rituals that just get you through your day. Yeah, all of these things are just manifestations of this same um, 
kind of cognitive predisposition that we have arbitrarily said, oh, that's religion, because it serves the interests of European imperialism primarily. There is a wonderful paper, um, see if I can pull it up. That by by the way, while, while, while you're trying to pull yeah. that up, I will say like, I think one of the, one of the most, uh, uh, I, I think, forward thinking and, and innovative theorists of, of language and the evolution of language right now is, is really strongly positing language as a spandrel as well. And, it, and it's a pretty convincing argument that he's making. His name's Terence Deacon. And it's a, it's a pretty strong argument. Not, not, it's a spandrel that turns out to be very, very useful, but yeah. did not evolve primarily for its use. Yeah, and, and, and this is something that in cognitive linguistics they've talked about. We think about language as a means of conveying information, but the primary thing that it served, the reason it was selected, was because it facilitates social relationships mm -hmm. and social cohesion, and transmitting information is secondary. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I found this paper, uh, Rushain Abbasi. Uh, Islam and oh, the invention I've read this of before. religion. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a hundred and six page paper, <laughs> so it is. It's a. It's a doozy. Well, a lot of those are notes, though, right? Um, just, just like forty pages are, or something. Are there? I think they're footnotes. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it talks about how um, the uh, Islamic notion of deen was kind of conceptually parallel to uh, to what was created uh, within Protestant Christianity, but that was not the version of religion that has kind of taken over the Western world. So a lot of people, it was not Christianity that originated the concept of religion, Islam, because Islamic scholars were um, advanced philosophers before. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we took the texts and, and translated them back, they were coming up with some very similar ideas before that. So I don't want to suggest that this is all the work of Christianity, it was not, but but the concept that we have today is primarily built on the foundation that the Reformation and the Enlightenment provided. And I want to mention a book too, um, I don't care if we pull it up, but the author is Tomoko Masuzawa, mm -hmm. and it's called The, the Invention, Invention of World, World Religions. Religions yeah. um, I, I, I got to take classes from her at Michigan. Um, uh, she's an exceptional scholar, and it's an exceptional book, um, and, and, and really helps it a whole lot in this, in this regard. Um, but, you know, what, what does all this have to do with Under the Banner of Heaven? What does all this have to do with what larger subtexts uh, Black and Krakauer are exploring? Okay? And I want to bring up another book to talk about that. This is... Yep, this is the one. This is a great book by a scholar named William Cavanaugh called The Myth of Religious Violence. And, and one of the things that this book explains is... Ooh, Sorry, it was highlighted. It's not that green or bluish. It's more <laughs> like But uh, talks about how religion was created to serve these goals. And uh, one of these goals is to, or, or one of the ways that it has been manipulated is to paint religious as uniquely religion, as uniquely violent, inherently, innately violent. And as religious violence over and against secular violence, as unauthorized. As delegitimate, morally right. illegitimate. Whereas secular violence can be authorized. It's not always authorized, but it can be And it's more likely to be in, in places where you have democracy and constitutionalism right. and checks and balances and that kind of thing. I mean, this, this, as the theory goes, at least. I'm not necessarily endorsing this. but um, and, and he talks uh, at length about uh, Islam and the early 2000s and how this myth that religion is uniquely violent is the cause of 9-11 and of a lot of extremism uh, and uh, violent fundamentalism and things like that. Whereas the folks who are leveling those charges at religion are then turning around and not, even, not only excusing, but state in some violence. cases championing yeah. state violence on the grounds that the secular state must be supreme and that it basically holding it up in, in some sense as, uh, as a deity. I mean, one of the things that was so weird about Christopher Hitchens at that time was he was just this like ferocious critic of, of, of you know, uh, religious violence, but then he was also like, yes, war in Iraq now, yes, please, yeah. very much right this second. And, and folks like Sam Harris saying, oh, you know, I relish, I would love to kill these people, kind of <laughs> like 
championing violence, saying people who have these beliefs are basically beyond saving and should just be killed. Yeah, they're 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 like they're a cancer on the modern world, yeah. and they cause more harm. Like we just we're, we'll be better off as soon as as soon as like the sooner we get rid of them. And it's the exact same rationalization, only it's holding up the secular state as as the um, transcendent. Uh, framework rather than than religion, and it is and Krakauer is in lockstep with these guys exactly. And this is and this is what we're kind of getting at is that Krakauer's critique is basically picking up that critique from Hitchens and Harris and the others, and saying I'm going to point it at uh, Mormon I'm, fundamentalism. I'm going to point it at I'm going to point it at religion by pointing at Mormonism by pointing at Mormon fundamentalism and making these things interchangeable with each other. And all, all different manifestations of an underlying truth, capital T truth, which is that religion causes violence. And if it's not checked by the state, if it's not checked by rationality, it will inevitably cause violence. And I know you had your hand up, but I want to say one more thing before I, I get to you. And one of the most, what I found is the most ridiculous manifestations of how tortured this logic is, is the notion that because religion is inherently violent, Martin Luther King was not really a Christian <laughs> because as a pacifist, he rejected the very core of the Bible and therefore could not have believed in the Bible. Because I'm an authority on the core of the Bible. Right, right. Well, <laughs> because the Bible is inherently violent, you cannot be a pacifist and a true believer in the Bible. Therefore, Martin Luther, or Martin Luther King Jr. was not a real, he was nominally a Christian, but otherwise a secularist. The, lo the logic and, is so circular. Yeah. It, worked, it works with, with, with violent Muslims. It works with violent Christians. It's basically, this religion is violent. Well, how do you know? Well, because these people who are in the religion are violent. Okay, but why are they representative of the, of the, of the core? Because, 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 they're, because violence is the core. And then there and if, were if violence is the core. Then right. like nonviolent people are on the periphery. Violent people are at the core. And if people are so nonviolent that they never engage in violence, then they're not they're not even real Muslims right. or right. real Christians. And this is where Harris says that the radicals are the actual the true Muslims, the true Christians, they're the because only they're doing true everything ones. literally. Mm -hmm. And as and as I've tried to suggest uh, in earlier weeks. There's no such thing as scriptural literalism. There's ideological literalism, and the scriptures are the excuse. The only, the only true Mormons are the ones going around trying to behead drunk people and throw javelins Mary through the hearts of, of men in tents. Yeah, and, yeah. That, yeah. And, and that is a way to say... And if you're not doing that, you're just pretending to be Mormon, but you're not really the real thing. Right. Okay, go ahead. What were you going to say? Um, I, I think it's very interesting because cause the... Uh, from what I've read from Native American scholarship on religion, mm -hmm. they tend to think that um, religion is just like everything a person does. Like uh, uh, to say that, like that, to say that there is a division between the secular state and mm -hmm. the religion. That, like the religion is the amalgamation of those two things and what those what people within those two things do. So like, like which which is a personalizing thing, but it also means that you get to say things like, you know, Christianity is a religion. Uh, of colonialism, even though there's nothing in Christianity that explicitly says you should go settle or colonialize a continent. Right. Um, and so, which like, uh, uh, which which seems to be encompassing both the 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 main scholarship that you've been talking about, and then the and then the Sam Harris type scholarship that's like the radicals are the are, mm -hmm. the, real are the real thing. Um, uh, uh, like how in, in like mainline scholarship, how is that like reconciled in terms of like like uh, uh, we say that there's a division between the state and religion, but like science in a way is as much of a religion as anything else ever has been, or or secularism is as much of a religion as anything else ever has been. Like is that is that division is there just like not a meaningful distinction there, or is it like? Uh, uh, or Try, trying it, to impose the meaning that 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 distinction that distinction and insisting on the distinction is a part of religion, like it's a function of religion to impose that distinct of a certain kind of religion and a certain modern way of thinking about religion insists on that distinction or or opposition to religion. Yeah, it, and it's it's a value it's value laden, and so for for many mainstream mainline scholars today. The, the best approach is to treat religion discursively. It is reified in discourse and what that means for, for those who don't like the... <laughs> everybody I know who's like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, 
these things don't exist outside of our discussions about them. And how we do them. We create the categories in the discussion. We and encode so, behaviors, we modify the encodings and contest right. the encodings, we perform the encoded behaviors, and all of that, it's just discourse all the way down. And so it is, uh, when scholars try to talk about what religion is, they treat it as whatever a community says it is, not in an essential, real life, this exists apart from our discourse about it kind of way, but in the sense of, for religion to have any meaning, we have to treat it as a group treats it. And so religion is whatever a group says religion is. And, and I will also say, like, at the risk of engaging in like, the no true Scotsman fallacy here, I'm still going to go ahead and go out on a limb and, and say there, are, there is not a serious social scientist of religion, an anthropologist, a sociologist, a, 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 a cognitive linguist. There are not serious scholars of religion out there, totally irrespective of their private personal religious affiliations or histories or beliefs or anything like that, who take the Sam Harris crowd seriously. Who think that who like like they they it, it's it's a non-starter because the one thing that all scholars of religion agree on is that Sam Harris does not know what religion is, <laughs> and that neither did Rich, neither does Richard Dawkins and neither did Christopher Hitchens, and and maybe neither does Daniel Dennett. You know, Nietzsche knew what religion was. Nietzsche mm -hmm. knew what Christianity was. He had he had strong you know a lot to say about it, but he actually knew what it was. He understood it. Okay, I don't know which one. Go ahead. Uh, so it's clear that somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. was a closeted uh, secularist, as this is as what I understand your the critique of Sam Harris to be. Um, but he, it does seem like it may be useful to have some kind of label that distinguishes him from other kinds of Christians, perhaps. Uh, useful to what? Useful um, in. Maybe, I, hmm, it's like, you, maybe I'll just say personally useful, uh, because I, I admire Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, approach to religion, and his approach was that, uh, was like, um, uh, lack of a better word, like a non-literalist reading of Jesus, and a non-literalist reading of the, of the New Testament stories. And so... Um, I find that personally useful to say, like, okay, here's somebody who is a minister who is able to be a, what I might call like a spiritual humanist, you know, like in, investing in in religion but doing it in such a way that recognizes the humanity of all human beings. Um, and I see that as distinct from the way many people of religion live and believe religion. Uh, so. I, I can see the criticism of Sam Harris, even if the conclusion isn't correct, in terms of saying, like, is it, is it perhaps useful to say, like, hey, there's a better way we can do religion, and Martin Luther King Jr. embodies that. Um, but I don't think, I don't think it, there's, uh, like, the, the best things about Martin Luther King as, as, as sort of like a person to admire, as a religious figure to admire, I don't think they have anything to do with the particular character of his beliefs in supernatural or in miracle or in the resurrection or anything like that. And I, w I would also say that Christianity has a long history of using non-literal interpretations to try to respond to situationally emergent concerns and circumstances and things like that. And this is why I think it's important to keep in mind that texts don't have inherent meaning. And so there's no such thing as a literal reading of, of the Bible or of the New Testament, I would suggest there are, um, there are interpretations that serve There's some There's also no such thing as an uninterested reading. Right. Um, and so the... Pardon? Just, I'm thinking some are Bible and some are Like some interpretations... Yes, yes, the Bible yes. And some there are... It, de it depends and, on and what tribals. the goal... Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, mostly about uh, identity politics. Mm -hmm and serving one's structuring of power and values and, and, um, and social standing. But Christianity has had to make use of non-literal interpretations since the very beginning. As soon as Marcion in the second century, his argument for jettisoning the Hebrew Bible was done away with, we now had to deal with, all right, we're keeping it. What do we do with all of this? Because we've got 
a psalm that says, blessed is the one who, who crushes your baby's heads against the rocks. And so uh, you had folks like Origen and others who came up with different levels of meaning, and you basically picked whatever level of meaning, anagogic, moral, uh, historical, these different levels, to serve whatever your rhetorical goals were, whatever circumstance you were using the text to respond to. And, and so that's been, um, that's been the, the habit all the way up until uh, we got to the Enlightenment, and you had the challenge to young earth creationism and things like that of evolution. And that's when conservative Christians began to dig in their heels and say, no, the text means what the text says, and we're in charge of what the text says, and stop doing this. And you get um, inerrancy as a, as a result of that. Inerrancy becomes the kind of line in the sand. But it's not, li- it's not necessarily literalistic at all. I mean, right, right. I don't, think, I don't think very many, for example, like biblical inerrantists think that it was actually a snake talking. They think some do, but some, <laughs> some think it was the devil and, and that he's being symbolically well, represented as a snake. Yeah, an, another example would be Psalm 82. Uh, God stands in the council of gods yeah. and judges among the gods. They're like, that's not literal. Um, but in, even inerrancy, yes, is not about literalism. Yeah. It is about ideological literalism. I'm being, going to be one It's about ideological literal. fidelity. Yeah, really. I'm, my fidelity ideology... To this t- this way of reading the text. Right, and so whatever reading is required to serve my ideological interest is going to be what I'm going to assert. And so literalism becomes kind of a, 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 a way to refer to that, but literalists will always abandon literalism as soon as literalism causes problems uh, for them, yeah. which it frequently does. Now, you had your hand up a minute ago. Do yeah. you still want to <laughs> This is This is, no, I mean, maybe this addresses what I was going to say, and, and maybe it does or maybe it doesn't, is I was just thinking, like, saying religion causes violence is maybe a different thesis than saying violence comes from religion, because not all religion causes violence, but maybe... Some people could argue that all violence does stem from religion in some way, and so to refute that, I would think you would need to find. I think I think that was secular. I think that one, which which is also the the history of humanity is replete with secular violence. In fact, in fact, secular you can most wars are a product of nationalism or of exploitation or of. Uh, something yeah. like that. Very C- rarely, will, for resources. very rarely will a country go to war for religion if it's not economically viable and yeah. profitable right. to do so. And so I, I think I think you're moving in the right direction, though. I would say religion is just as given to violence as it is to peace. It is a just like just language. Like language. Yeah. yeah, it is a tool that can be picked up and used in the service of any one of a number any of different... Yeah, uh, sort of political, ideological, yeah. war-making, peace-making, well, and, and, and... Maybe we've... A lot of people who are maybe making these arguments, I'm thinking now, are retroactively applying a label of religion to things that have caused violence that maybe at the time people didn't see as religion. But now we're going, oh yeah, that was religion, that's Which caused violence. this so. book, Another Manner of Heaven. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so you... It's, it's a lot of people trying to say, trying to either say this is innate to religion or this is alien to religion because it serves our own identity politics, our own structuring of values and power. Now you but had anytime your... somebody says something is innate to religion, pay very close to attention to what saying. That, that is never an interest-free statement. That is never a statement that's not like anchored to a polemical and an ideological and even an like identity political goal. Like to say it, it is so powerful to allege something intrinsic about something else. Here. And so I think um, when we talk about the murders of Brenda and Erica Lafferty as something that wasn't, you know, the, the argument tends to try to paint this as something that was inevitable, that yeah. this ha- that could have led to no other, It was yeah. overdetermined by Brigham Young, basically. Yeah. And, and this is a way to take this event and trace it back to its roots in a text and a religion, and which is ultimately just trying to implicate religion, and particularly religions that are based on sacred texts, which, which by the way, is phenomenally rare. It's also very but rare. But we have treated as kind of a the, universal. the essence of it. Now you had your hand up a minute ago. Oh, Do you I'm remember? Sorry, I, I, my ADHD has like taken the wheel, and I just, <laughs> the original thought was, um, I, I do think it's in, like like. 
uh, uh, this is one of those situations where you say, like, where it's like, is Martin Luther King, like, really a Christian? Like, that line in the sand is just like, uh, uh, I, I don't think it's helpful under any framework, because, like, it, it says more about what, how you feel about certain kinds of violence than it does certain kinds of religion. Like, is Malcolm X a good Muslim? I, that, I think that depends on your view of, like, do you think that that kind of violence is justified? Yeah. Um, do you think that, uh, uh, you, uh, like, do you think that, um, you know, a, a, like, a, like, a, like a Christian that goes against the American government for one cause or another, uh, uh, is that a good religion? Like if, if or was young, Dwight Eisenhower a good Christian yeah, because he fought fascists? Is, is, you know? is, if young earth Christians were people that, like, that somehow from that claim got to a point of like, and that means we need to be humanitarian and kind and... And uh, respect uh, creation uh, and be uh, environmentally conscious. Yeah. And, like if it was things that you liked, you, like, you wouldn't necessarily say it's like irrational or logical because the thing that they're doing is fundamentally similar to the thing that you are doing, belief right. notwithstanding. So, um, and the other thing I was thinking is like feng shui is a really interesting example because it's an incredibly passive thing in the fact that it's mostly aesthetic decisions. Um, but it's aesthetic decisions that are like uh, uh, grounded in a, like a human-centered reality. Like there's a lot of feng shui things like don't put lots of columns in the middle of your house because it sucks because you're a forest creature that hates being in the forest. <laughs> uh, uh, and like, that is something that turned out to be true when we started doing modern architecture. That like putting lots of columns, actually extremely anxiety. It's, it's psychologically humans. disruptive for a lot of people. Um, yeah. and, and like, but like we don't think of Feng Shui as a religion because it doesn't do a whole lot other than say, this is where you should be sitting relative this to- This is how you'll be comfortable and-, and, and even well, though it's like probably more real than a, like and applicable than a lot of like religious other religious things, like I I don't practice feng shui spiritually, but I apply the aesthetic principles because yeah. I find them very nice. Yeah, and 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 Brent Nongbury, uh, before religion from twenty thirteen, another great book, a lot more accessible than some of the other these other ones. But he points out that religion primarily today is used to refer to anything that is sufficiently similar to Protestant Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that has to do with why you are using uh, the term. And, and yeah, something like Feng Shui. If you tried to break it down to uh, necessary and sufficient features of religion at some point, it's going to bleed into that. But, like but yeah, it, it doesn't serve anybody anybody's interest yeah. to, to define it that way. Go ahead. Um, I was just thinking about the... An argument I saw between Sam Harris and Scott Atrian, which I'm not sure uh -huh. if you're familiar yeah. with. Yeah. Um, but he, I kept thinking about their argument and, um, you know, the argument that violence and religion are somehow just like innate and poorly. But um, I keep thinking about making the argument not only of what is religion and finding a definition for religion, but also of violence and thinking that in this uh, documentary particularly, or in I don't know if you call it documentary, Under the Banner of Heaven in this mm -hmm. film, or in this um, series, it is showcasing another kind of, not just um, religion, but also a different kind of violence that's being implicated throughout the entire series of like a symbolic violence of like, of, of this kind of patriarchal of violence. Of, like, yeah. yeah, of all these different kinds of things. And it's not until it reaches like a, you know, it's like, it's almost portrayed as um, physical violence as being like the peak Right, like this is the one people are caring about. This is the one that's important. This is the one that gains secular attention, when all these other elements of violence are being completely like underplayed. And yeah, like the the one um, when he's in the bank and he says, "Oh, I just thought that was a domestic." When yeah. he saw uh, Ron hit his wife, Literally and it's like, yeah. and and uh, it minimizes it in the interest of of holding the other one up. One one point I wanted to make is though that while. I'm, we're suggesting saying violence is innate or inherent to religion is, is a category error in a lot of ways. That does not mean that what we call religion does not play a role as a tool. It cannot be made to play a right. role. Because right. every, every tool that we ever pick up and use exercises a degree of agency in how we, we use it. And so there are ways that different Heidegger, religious... Is that you? What's that? <laughs> I said, Heidegger, is that you? <laughs> Um, and so the, the different re religious ideologies can canalize, put it into a canal to direct it in certain ways so that violence is manifested in ways that accord with 
things in a, a given community's past. But whether or, or not attacked, religious people or, are going to commit violence is is a, is, a, is is not determined by the religion, but right. it's it's. Uh, yeah. Or, or it's determined by the community as, as much as anything, by, by community dynamics, and then definitely, definitely by the individual. And it doesn't do anybody any good. If, like, if you really want to get to the bottom of it, you really want to explain and understand a particular act of violence or a particular pattern of violence, really like the least useful thing you can say is, oh, well, this was just overdetermined from the top because, or from its past. Like, this was just, this, this happened because it was inevitable that it was going to happen in Brigham Young's church. So not necessarily top down, but not necessarily bottom up. It's, it's the two like interacting. The right. but, yeah. but in any case, if you talk about it in overdetermined terms, then you become powerless to really do anything about it. The only thing you can do to stop violence is uh, reject Brigham Young's church. I mean, that, that's going to somehow magically make people less violent. Which is certainly part of the rhetorical goals. It's certainly this, part of the rhetorical this, goal of the um, series, I, I agree. But it's like, that, speaking of Sam Harris, there, there was a debate he had a decade or so ago with Reza Aslan about, um, about uh, the, the politics of Israel-Palestine and whether religion is intrinsically harmful. And, and Aslan made such an important point but like, that... that and, and the implications of his point are even more important. His point was that, like, if you were trying to understand the conflict between Israeli leadership and, uh, and the PLO or Hamas or bet between is Israeli settlers and, 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 and Palestinians who have been there, if you're trying to understand this conflict and your primary lens for understanding it is that your explanation is that the conflict is happening because Israel's leaders think they have a biblical claim on the land, mm -hmm. you are not going to get anywhere in understanding it. Like you are, you, that is a delusional understanding. Like at best, that is like a secondary or tertiary, uh, uh, you know, like passing rationalization for what's going on here. And, and if you don't understand it, you can do nothing about it. No matter how committed you are to understanding, to, to stopping the thing that you misunderstand, your misunderstanding will stop you from stopping it. Like if you wanna do something about patriarchal violence, which I think we all do, then we have an obligation to tell the truth about it, right? And that means, that means not ignoring it, not putting our head in the sand and, and pretending like Mormonism has nothing to do with it. And it also means not over-determining it by saying Joseph was a violent <laughs> dog and Brigham was even more violent and they, they, they punished a woman and like there, all these parallels are there and he's the Lion of the Lord and it was just like inevitable because Mormonism breeds dangerous men. So if Mormonism can stop existing and then it won't breed dangerous men anymore. And I, and I think one of the ways that, that we can address a lot of this is last week uh, I talked about how I don't think texts are the roots of violence, but they can influence violence. And when we engage in, we use texts and our history, our sacred past, to structure power and values. And it is that structuring of power and values that can facilitate violence and oppression and abuse and all these kinds of things. And it's, there's a reason why uh, uh, youth, teenagers who have, have taken their own lives because they couldn't stop masturbating and because you know, they were told that they were basically hellbound for that or that LGBTQIA plus uh, youth and adults have done similar things because we've structured, we've used rhetoric about that as a way to emphasize how important we consider these values. And even the, one, and the ones that haven't taken their own lives have also been victims of, again, those subtler forms of yeah. violence that aren't quite at the, at, the, at the apex, but psychological violence, psychosocial violence, intimate sort of interactive violence, yeah. you know, the subtle form of violence that lots of people experience in lots of ways. Texts don't cost the present, the past costs the present. Right, <laughs> <laughs> and how we how we use it, how we we manifest it, yeah, and decide history, it's important. Yeah. Nothing yeah. is outside of history, and no, so nothing is independent I, from history I, and is not a product of it. I read an essay. Of, well, actually, I read a a, a, book, a journal on um, specifically uh, alternate timeline stories, mm -hmm. breaking them down, and, and one of the things was, uh, uh, in in every way, a realist 
any narrative of the present, and any narrative of history is a alternate history from the real past. Yeah. That like you're, you're re-narrativizing things. It's all map and not territory. Yeah. yeah. And the map is the map we want because it's... The one that makes sense. It's going to help us in some way or another, yeah. And, re Which, and religion is a really complicated map well, also without like, territory. Like, using history as the causality for things is, like, also a very uh, uh, European tradition because, uh, again, I've read Native American scholarship where they're like, yeah, we don't, like, justify ourselves with our past. We justify it with our place. Um which is uh, a very different way of thinking about things. Well, I think we should wrap up. I think it's been a good discussion. We've got a couple episodes to watch between now and two weeks from now, so we'll see where all this ends up. But thank you guys for being here. Any last questions, concerns, cheese days? Could really use some cheese days. <laughs> cheese maze also. Okay. All right, thank Take you so you much guys. for coming. We appreciate it. <laughs>